Um, thank you so much for coming here tonight to talk about this. Uh, this is Antonia's book, um, and it's it's a wonderful. Uh, I know we're going Before to try to. After. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful story, um, not just because your own background is so rich, but also the way you write it is is just captivating. Um, it, it almost feels like you were born knowing you wanted to be a historian. Is I that think right? that's absolutely true. No, I think I, I was born, I'm, I'm of the opinion that after emerging from my mother, I said, where is the pen and paper so I can record the experience? <laughs> that may not be quite true, but I, I did, um, I, I was a very early reader and a sort of early writer. And people often ask me, when did you decide to become a writer? But I never decided to become a writer. I just was a writer. You know, it doesn't mean I wrote well. There are lots of people who are writers. They don't necessarily, or they may begin writing badly, and then they write better, like many things. But I just, oh, I can't remember when I didn't write. Did you write, when you first wrote, did you write factual stuff? Did um, you record what was going on in a diary way? I didn't exactly know the difference, you know. I, I used to go for long walks and tell myself romantic stories in which, oddly enough, the heroine was called something like Antonia Packenham, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I think that the, the, the sort of strong distinction which there is between sort of fiction and non-fiction isn't something I think that children go, go in for. And the first book I read which really turned me on to history, Our Island Story, is in fact brilliantly factual. I mean, when you get to know real history, you realize that Henrietta Marshall mm -hmm. doesn't invent. But I just thought it was wonderful, and I loved it. And then I thought, so history has all the exciting stories. I thought it was more exciting than Black Beauty. You, know. you, you were a terribly fast reader. I mean, you, you make reference to that in this book, but you don't actually say how many books you were getting through in a week. I, I, would, I wouldn't dare because you'd stone me, actually. <laughs> no, it's, uh, my mother, um, very intelligent woman, very energetic, when she first married, and I was born a year later, um, she didn't work because people of her sort, you know, didn't, and she had been working as a lecturer at the WEA in Stoke-on-Trent, and I think she couldn't bear being idle, and so she taught me to read, and we think, we came to think, she might have taught me speed reading by mistake, although I don't read like <laughs> they don't, I, I don't read like speed readers down the page, but I do read photographically, and I know the distinction between looking and listening to the sound in your head because, as it happens, I read French um, listening to it. You see, um, and and so I read French a good deal less quickly than I read English. So somehow I photograph it. But oh, how lucky I was. It's terribly unpopular. I mean, people used to, in trains, sitting opposite me when I was a teenager. I remember one man led forward and said, I hope you don't think you're reading that book. <laughs> You've got that story. <laughs> and then it's very good for earning cash. You see, grown-ups would be told. Antonia's a very quick reader, and um, she reads all sorts of things. So look smug, and they'd hand me Walter Scott. And of course, it was a doddle, really, and up came half a crown. And it was Did they quiz good. you on it afterwards? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but do, do you think that your love of reading and taking long walks was, was part of being the, the, you were the oldest of eight children yes. to this very energetic, amazing mother? What, what was it like being, you know, being, being her child? Well, you see, I'm sure everybody knows what I mean. You don't know what it's like being another child until you're grown up. And in some ways, it wasn't until I came to write this book. Um, my parents lived to their mid-90s, but died, I suppose, over 10 years ago, but not more. It wasn't until I started to write about it, particularly my mother, that I began to realize how extraordinary she was. You know, things um, I'd taken for granted. I mean, she stood for Parliament in 1950, um, which she had eight children under three. And some, there was a, she stood for parliament in Oxford, by the way. And this was in the February 1950 election. And I came down with her. My parents had moved to Hampstead Garden Suburb because my father was in the Labour government. 
And I came down with her. I was actually looking out. I'd read Bright's had revisited, and I thought I might see a sort of likely undergraduate. I was 17. And so I went down with her. And I sat on the, the end of the platform, sort of there. Mm -hmm. And a man dared to say, Lady Packenham, as she then was, Lady Packenham, um, uh, you're standing for Parliament, but you've got eight children. Aren't your children neglected? And my mother, quick as a flash, pointed at me and said, stand up, Antonia. And I got up, and I was 17, and everything about me was round, you know, <laughs> round face, round cheeks, round. And she said, does she look neglected? And there was a tremendous roar of laughter. <laughs> and I learned about politicians who can't trust them. <laughs> Um, but, but my history has a kind of double meaning because it's not just your history as being a child growing into a historian, it's also the extraordinary history of your parents. Uh, I mean, I didn't know until I read the book um, that your father was actually beaten up by the black shirts and, and it was a, a greatly politicising event for him. My father became a socialist having, uh, when I was born he was working in the conservative central office and then he became a socialist. My mother became one a few years before. They both came from Tory backgrounds, no uh, labour relations at all, and they became socialists out of conviction. And my father went to a meeting in the town hall at Oxford in uh, May 1936 from memory. Uh, and, um, I mean, memory of my book, not my memory, and, and um, it, it was Mosley, and Mosley was there, sort of the black shirt, you know, very upstanding, sort of good-looking, handsome man, and the, his thugs, and um, various communist and socialist people started to ask mm -hmm. questions, and finally the thugs started to beat them up, including my father. And my mother took me into the spare bedroom, which was an icy room in Oxford. Nobody ever went into it. And, and I thought he must have done something wrong to be in this awful room. And, and my mother showed me, and there was my father with these appalling bruises, I mean, really, all over. And she said, never forget, the fascists have done that. And I never did forget. You can't forget no, that. No, you it's see extraordinary sight to see. And then we're qu I mean, it was a famous incident. Uh, questions were asked about it in the House of Commons and that sort of thing. And it, it was instrumental in propelling your father into politics? Um, no, he was already interested. Yeah. He worked in Conservative Central Office, but I think it made up his mind, made, yeah. made up his mind uh, to join the Labour Party. And so you've had both parents as socialist politicians yes. at this point. Um, did it make you want to be political as a child? I mean, were you a campaigner? Were you someone who was... I loved canvassing, actually. I still love canvassing. If there's anybody here standing in the next election would I'm like sure me to canvass someone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted. I've canvassed for both sides, so... Um, I <laughs> It, it, canvassing, if you're inquisitive, and I'm very inquisitive, Joanna, in her wonderful speech, was talking about sort of listening. Because Joanna to should definitely go canvassing. Joanna should definitely go. You, you, you get, you know, you're licensed to knock on doors, and of course, I only canvassed in daylight, so it's mainly women uh, in those days, and dogs, and then, you know, everything exciting has got us a bad side to it, and these dogs, you know, were they Tory dogs or good <laughs> Labour dogs? And then later in my life, were they Labour dogs or good Tory dogs? <laughs> but it's great fun asking questions and, and sort of being able to do it. And I, I never once in all that time encountered somebody who wasn't polite and nice and being invited in, you know. And uh, I mean, I think obviously in writers there is something deeply inquisitive. Some might say nosy, you know. Um, I got the feeling reading about your mum, your mother wanting you to be more political than perhaps you were. It, it, when you wanted to go to Oxford and read history, she said, no, Antonio, you ought to go and read PPE. Now, was this to push you to politics or was this no, to push you I towards an exhibition? It was to push me towards a scholarship, hopefully. She was... Uh, Which she got. Um, <laughs> well, uh, um, uh, um, people talk a lot these days, they use a word called privilege. Um, and I'm uh, um, starting a campaign to say privilege doesn't necessarily mean money. Um, you can be privileged. I, my parents didn't have money. Um, in fact, Oxford Don, as my father was, doesn't earn very mm -hmm. much money. Um, 
nevertheless, I was privileged in a real way. First of all, my parents loved each other, so I took that for granted. And then my mother was tremendously keen on girls' education, and I was her eldest child. Now, that is a privilege. Yeah. So, I, to me, that's the real meaning of the word. Because if, you, if privilege is always materialistic, are you saying the rich are always happy, ha, ha, mm -hmm. you know, and poor people make wonderfully happy lives. Of course, it'd be much nicer if they had more money. But I, I, I'd like privilege to have many meanings. Do you agree with me, Rosa? Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I, I mean, I think that you, reader, reading your book, um, you had access and conversations. I, I love your relationship with Anthony Powell, for instance. I mean, the talking to him, and, and I love the moment when you say you'd like to be possibly a character in future, yeah. because you're looking around for all his characters. Anthony Powell was married to my father's sister, and uh, I grew up with him as my uncle and became my friend. And um, I don't know whether I would have read his book so young if he'd not been my uncle, but I became a tremendous fan and remain so. And um, um, I sort of daringly thought perhaps I would feature, you know, I got rather excited at the idea. And so I said, Tony, do you think I might be a character in your books? And he looked at me, had a sort of wonderful, bland laugh, you know, and he looked at me and said, no, Antonio, you're a resolved character. And I was very impressed. I had no idea what he meant. What is a resolved character? And it was years afterwards when I found this in my diary, I realized it was his clever, tactful way of saying, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great line, though. Um, after Oxford, you, you get a job. I'm skipping forward because I wanted, before we run out, yeah. get to the writing of your first history book. Too you, um, you get a job with Weidenfeld and Nicholson, with George yes. Weidenfeld, who was a hugely important character in your life and remains your publisher. And still is. 95. And, and is still, and you've published every book. Yes. And did he, did he encourage you at the beginning to... I mean, I know you wrote a couple of books before you got to marry Queen of Scots, didn't you? Well, but more. I mean, I actually... I did... Um, I mean, the first published book I had, uh, uh, Weidenfeld and Nicholson, as it was, it's now a big publisher called Orion overall, but uh, Weidenfeld and Nicholson got its income from doing something called the Heirloom Library for Marks and Spencer, which were children's classics out of copyright with new illustrations. And that's where we got our money and, and sort of keep us going. And George came back from the annual meeting and we all sat around listening to what we were gonna do. And then he said, um, well, this year we want this, we want that, and we're going to have King Arthur. And I saw my chance to speak, you know, I was 21 and I didn't get many chances to speak. But that one. So I said, oh no, George, we can't have uh, a, a King Arthur because Mort D'Arthur is um, far too unreadable for modern children. Um, and then I sort of threw in clever clogs and T.H. White is in copyright. And George just said, oh, Antonio, you will write it. And so I wrote it. I wrote my, I wrote my version of King Arthur. And so at what point did you do your first, your Mary Queen of Scots? Well, then I, then I did Robin Hood, and then after I was married, I did a history of dolls and history of toys. And then um, I was always mad about Mary Queen of Scots. It's one of the main characters in our island story, the book I'd loved from the age of four. And one day, my mother, Elizabeth Longford, who'd gone from politics to being a biographer, but very shortly before. Um, and she'd had this very successful, wonderful book, Queen Victoria. And she came to see me, allegedly to have um, tea with my little children, but actually to talk about her career, which was exciting. And she said, Graham Watson, who was her agent, um, and a very sort of nice, headmasterly, benign man, says I should do Mary Queen of Scots. And I froze. I, I just thought, what am I going to say? And so I said, no, you can't do that. She's my Mary Queen of Scots. And then I thought, what on earth can I say to her to stop her forever? And so I, I said, you can't do it. You're far too moral. <laughs> Well, no, nobody's ever complained about being called moral. She couldn't say, no, I'm not at all moral. Besides, she was moral. <laughs> but 
she she didn't do it. Did she, she didn't particularly. She didn't particularly want and, to do and it. And you did, and, and it I became did, I did a giant it. bestseller. Yes, wasn't I lucky? <laughs> Well, I think you were actually very good. <laughs> well, I know. Well, we, I like to think that. But, but well, actually, it was also tremendously good fortune. You know, I just came into historical biography when nobody knew it, but the public really wanted it. And, and um, how lucky I was. Well, and you've made it a great art form and given many people, me included, lots of pleasure. And that, our, our glass has run out. And thank you so much indeed for being here. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you.